morning, everybody. Welcome to service number two today on this Sunday. How are you doing? So most of you are not doing anything at all. Okay. Hey, I've, I've got a special. You came on a special Sunday, and uh, every year we track this a little bit. Not a big deal, but today happens to be our 39th anniversary as a church, our 39th birthday. I'm only 42 years old. <laughs> wow, thir- 39 years. Technically, just so you know how to do the math, that means we're starting our 40th year tomorrow. Whoa. You might say, well, where'd this church come from anyways? Well, I was a youth pastor in town here at a different location. Well, I, I can tell you today, it's a funeral home, Boxwell Brothers. Uh, that church was dead when I was there. It's really dead now. And uh, so I'm not joking. I did my daddy's funeral at my old church. Anyways, I did. Um, but it just became so obvious way back in 1985 um, on this day that we just need to leave this place. God bless it, but we need to. We went to a lock, a lock shop, an old gas station, and there were 17 of us. And basically, we we're 29, 30 years of age, <clears throat> and uh, had a bunch of little babies running around. There were 17. I had done a Bible study with these guys on Thursdays. I was just hoping to go back to Colorado. I just, you know, I've been here. No offense to anybody from Texas, but I'm going back to Colorado. And God had a different plan. So we met in that lock shop, the 17 of us. We didn't know what we were doing. We did not have a mother church. We didn't have a denomination. We had zero dollars, didn't have a name, but we had 17 people and a Bible. And the Holy Spirit. So we made a decision on that very first day, 39 years ago. We're going to follow Jesus with what this book tells us. Not jumping around topical sermons. We're going to preach through the book. And we're going to have teachable hearts. We didn't actually use that word. But, you know, you can show up and have your doctrinal statement. You can have your traditions. You can have your theology all in place. But this book doesn't change. And the more we talked the book, the more we learned. Now, when I say talk... We literally just walked through the Bible verse by verse. It took 32 years to accomplish preaching the whole book. Uh, Some parts of it I preached four or five times. But I want to know what this book says as we follow Jesus, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I want to know what this says. Not so much with that seminary or that denomination or that group. I want to know what this says with a teachable heart. And what has blessed me more than anything watching for 39 years, Grace Church is still learning what this book says. And some of the thoughts I had years and years ago, I've kind of reconsidered that. I've changed. I've actually jumped to the other side. Then I realized that sometimes both sides are true. What are you doing? I'm growing you up. And growing up Grace Church. So if you are a visitor, maybe, maybe you're not a visitor, but anyways, what we do, we make disciples verse by verse. You had to walk underneath that banner, that model, that saying, right? We make disciples. What does that mean? We are going to follow Jesus and make disciples as this book inspired by the Holy Spirit breathes it to us. And if we're doing it right, with a teachable heart, listening to the word of God, focused on Jesus, empowered with the Holy Spirit. You know what happens? You start looking like Jesus and not like the world. You start thinking and talking and you're like being the Lord Jesus right where you are. And then we come together a couple, three times a week 
By the way, we are the greatest church at Western Implants. We are not the greatest church in Amarillo. I'm just one of many pastors. But I do know what God wants me to do with this church, with you. By the way, you're actually at the highest intersection in Amarillo, Texas. Do the math. You are on Mount Amarillo. I always wanted to go to the mountains. It's the only one I'll get now. And uh, so you're at Mount Amarillo, Grace Church. And I really don't want to tell you about all the old stories. So we got miracle stories and resurrection stories and stories and stories. I mean, we got a ton, but I'm not really, I want to know what God's going to do next. Because I actually think the best is yet to come. I really do. I have been doing this long enough to know when there is a, like a new wave, a new wind, a new something going on, and that something's going on. If you were at our services last week, you got a glimpse, you had a sniff of that. And so I don't know what God's going to do next, but I do know what he wants me to do is to bring you the word in its context, in its counsel, and he's blessed that. Oh, he can bless a denomination. He surely can. He can bless a church. He surely can. But he always promises to bless his word. He promises to bless his word. So if I'm just smart enough to have a teachable heart, that's so key to it, a teachable heart, and have the Holy Spirit breathing fresh on me as I open up this book, which I did before I got out of bed this morning, and God met me there. Matter of fact, he's, he changed some of the sermon in the middle of the night. I thought, what are you doing, Lord? I've got a computer. And then I thought, ooh, that's a better way. So take your Bibles with me real quick. Take your Bibles. We're going to turn to the Bible. We've been going through the book of Acts. We're going to go through that same section. But i got to back up to Acts chapter 6. i got to back up to Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. We've watched the Holy Spirit fall on the church. We've watched the Holy Spirit come and come and come. He keeps sending them back to the temple mount where they you know, found our Lord guilty and then later where they crucified him. That's, that, that's where the Holy Spirit dropped on them. That's where the temple's at. That's all those things happening around there. And God kept sending those disciples back and back and back again. Why? To give all those priests, to give all those scribes, to give those Sadducees and Pharisees a second chance, a third chance, a fourth. Why? Because God's heart is for Israel. As well as his heart for Amarillo. So you got that second, third, fourth chance. And what happens in the development of that, the church is growing. There's some widows that need to be taken care of. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, pops up as one of the leaders, one of the servants of that movement, taking care of widows. When that all gets in place, notice what it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. By the way, we've got it on the screen, but you'll need to get a Bible because we're going to cover like 50-some verses today. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the back seat. If you don't have a Bible at home, you can steal one from here. I, I really mean that. You can steal one. Now, if you have one, don't read it. No, I mean, if you have one and you don't, don't take one. If you take one and don't read it, you might get fleas. I'm not... <laughs> But if you want a Bible, you can take one out of here. You got one on your phone. Okay, that's enough of that. Here's what the Word of God says. I, this, this is one of the key verses in the book of Acts. Then the Word of God spread. The Word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Can I hear you say greatly? greatly. In the Greek, that's mega. It's one thing when God is adding to the church. It's a whole other thing when he's multiplying the church greatly. I'm, I'm down for that. Why is that happening there? Because the church figured out how to take care of the widows. Stephen and the other deacons rose up. They're all anointed. They're full of the Holy Spirit. So guess what? When church is what it should be, the word of God, the word of God multiplied greatly. But then this unbelievable part. And a great mega, a great many of the priests we're obedient to the faith. It's one thing when Jews are coming to know Jesus and the Holy Spirit's falling and then more Jews and more. This is all in Jerusalem. 
and disciples being multiplied greatly. There's thousands upon thousands at this point in time in the early church. But those priests, those scribes, those rabbis, you know, the ones that really know the Bible. Every Jewish boy, by the time he was six, went off to what we would call elementary school with one thing in mind, to memorize the Torah before you're 11 years old. Every Jewish boy would memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, by heart. Oh, you want to be a priest, a scribe, a rabbi, a leader? Then you would go on from the time you're 12 to about 18, you would memorize the whole Old Testament. You put it to memory. You know the downside to that? You think you know what it says. You got it memorized, you got your religion, you got your traditions, you know what to do, that's what we'll do. Twice a week we'll fast, we'll make sure we're tithers and double tithers, we'll obey everything it says in the flesh. Do you know what you end up as? Self-righteous. We're better than you. We got it all together. We know our Bible. We know our Bible. Who is this? It happens to be the living word who wrote the word. And now you're judging him. You end up killing the Christ that came to save you. And then all these rumors about resurrection, and then all of a sudden, here comes these disciples, and then all of a sudden, here comes the Holy Spirit, and then here's this revival happening in our city. Well, somebody's got to stop it. Because they're multiplying greatly, and now even the priests. You see, the key of what I'm trying to get you to see, God wants to do a great work in Jerusalem with priests and scribes and Sadducees. They get time after time after time. But you've got to have a teachable heart. You've got to have a heart that says yes to the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Because if there's anybody in the room who thinks you've got it figured out, including me, You're delusional. You got a little bit figured out of this enormous, beautiful, wonderful truth that we call the gospel and the word of God and the moving of the Holy Spirit. Well, I've been doing this a long time and I graduated from, well, great, beautiful. But you're telling me you got it figured out? Your theology's finished? You've decided to adopt this guy or this guy or this guy, and that's where I stand. Way back in the day, when I was 20 years old, I was in my second year of Bible college, at Western Bible College. And I was taking a class called Theology Proper. Theology is the study of God. Properly was this class. And my professor came in, Paul Borden, graduate of Dallas Seminary. And I'll never forget what he said the very first thing in theology proper class, because it made me mad. I disagreed with it. I said, that can't be true. Because Paul Borden said this in theology proper. Can I see the quote? The mark of a theologian is that they keep changing their minds. Hey, I'm 20 years old. You're not going to change my mind. Hey, I'm 40. I've got it all figured out. Hey, I'm 68. At 68, I realized Paul Borden was telling the truth. Aren't we all wired the same way? We think we're right, we think we're right. I know I'm right, I know I'm right. I'm not gonna let, and then you find out, oh, the growing word of God with the Holy Spirit 
continues to show you more things about his grace, his love, his wrath, his word, and you. I love this church. It's a teachable church. We make disciples verse by verse. But the problem is me or thee. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the word of God. Because he's still shaping us to understand his son better, his grace better, his love better, his wrath better. All the things that you think you know that you know. And you might be right and yet there's more to where you could be wrong. What I love about Grace Church for 39 years, we're still growing, we're still learning. And the one thing I know is true, the word of God is true. The Holy Spirit wants you and me like he had Stephen. And things will work out to where all of a sudden you get your last sermon, your last shot. And Stephen preaches one of the greatest sermons in the Bible. And I'm still trying to learn from it. One of my guys that I do follow is Mike Winger. Mike Winger says this. Our commitment, our commitment is to the word of God. Not to a teaching that we've had and held on to. This often involves reconsidering our stance on certain issues. I thought it was this way. Oh, it might be that way. I know key to all of this is your understanding and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. I was brought up in a denomination. I don't think they believed in the Holy Spirit. They never talked about him. Then I got saved in a church that they were crazy over out there with what they said was the Holy Spirit. Then I went to a Bible college that basically said there is no Holy Spirit. They didn't say that, but that's what they were like. And then I started a church and started preaching through the Word of God. And the Word of God and the Holy Spirit taught me about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you, and me. I'm still learning. Father, thank you for, thank you for this beautiful story in our Bibles with Stephen, a man that four times your word tells us he's full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, and full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit. It's not that you're overemphasizing that. Stephen just was. And I pray that would be one mark with my life and my friends here today. And we realize, Lord, we realize we don't get drunk with wine. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it shows up in our conversation. It shows up, Lord, in our service. It shows up in our songs. It shows up in our marriages, everything. So I just pray, I pray today, we could see the Holy Spirit And his relationship, not just with our church, but with each one here today. I pray that your word would speak to us. I wouldn't try to contrive it or manipulate it. It would just be your word as we get to study together. Of course, we invite the presence of Jesus. We do not assume that he just goes where two or three are gathered. That's true, but Lord, we want to invite him. As he stands out the outside and knocks at the door, Jesus, would you come? Would you come? Would you give us the Holy Spirit upon us, not just in us. The Holy Spirit upon us. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are willing to be taught. And then, Lord, wherever we have to make adjustments, that in our spirit, in our will, we would want to do that. So I just thank you. Thank you for 39 great years. I look forward to the 40th, and yet thy will be done, because this could be my last sermon. I pray that I would preach it that would bring honor and glory to Jesus. He alone is worthy, and all God's people would say. Hey, to catch the context of what's going on, right there in Acts chapter six and verse seven, 
Okay, I've already set that up for you, but look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs amongst the people. He's the first guy after the apostles to actually do signs and wonders. He's not an apostle, but man, he's just a man of faith, a man full of the Holy Spirit. And so he's not just taking care of the widows. All of a sudden, he's doing stuff. And the more stuff he does, the more people come to the Lord. Are you tracking with me? You can grow in your faith. He had a teachable heart. That really ticked off the Sanhedrin. Because this revival is all of a sudden bringing in the priests. And so it's the same 70 guys, the same uh, Sadducees and Pharisees, the same courtroom that crucified found Jesus guilty months earlier. Also Peter and John, also the 12 apostles. They took the skin off their backs. It's the same group that haul in Stephen. The accusations, their lies, verse 13 of chapter 6. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, the temple, and change, he's gonna change the customs, the traditions which Moses delivered to us. Stephen in the very spot where Jesus stood. Stephen full of signs and wonders. The Holy Spirit. The same group of guys that murdered the Christ. You're on trial. Caiaphas, the high priest, makes, makes the mistake of saying, what say you, Stephen? Hmm. Well, I've got like 55 verses of what I'm going to say. And we have the privilege, we saw half of it last week, of one of the greatest sermons in your Bible. Stephen there bridging the Old Testament to the new. Stephen bringing out the gospel to the ones who crucified the Christ. Stephen, who's gonna give his life when this sermon's over and then the church pushes out to Amarillo by morning. I shared with you last week, I'm not gonna go over the whole sermon, but I'll pick it up where I left off. But I wanna get to the kicker verse. The kicker verse, go chapter seven, chapter seven. When he gets to the end of his sermon, he's in chapter seven, and in verse 51, here's his conclusion. You stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate. By the way, you don't make friends when you call them that. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist. Can I hear you say resist? Resist. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers, Old Testament, as your fathers did, so do you. You're acting just like your fathers, like fathers, like sons. At the end of his sermon, he simply says, You resist, you're stubborn, you're uncircumcised and hard in the air. You resist the Holy Spirit, just like your dads, just like your fathers did, all the way through. That that really is the key. The Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit's the one that talks to us. The Holy Spirit's the one that convicts us. The Holy Spirit's the one that comforts us. The Holy Spirit's the one that empowers us. He's the helper that Jesus said, I'll send to you. He'll empower you. And the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us dynamite kind of power so that we're witnesses. How are you doing? How am I doing? The Holy Spirit and, and you. Because don't we still, if we're not careful, we, we resist the Holy Spirit. If we're not careful, we could end up in the same group as these guys. I know what I believe, and this is where I stand, and you get out of here. So I'm just confessing to you again. I want to learn more about the Holy Spirit. And the last thing I want to do is resist him. I don't want to resist him. I want to listen to him. He wakes me up in the middle of the night and talks to me sometimes. It's not like an audible voice, but I know like, oh, you want me to change the sermon? Yeah, you need to move it from here to here. You need this verse. Down. Well, now, Lord, I already got it. I, I changed the sermon today. Not the whole thing, just, you know, you want me to, yeah, put these verses. It's, it's, 
It's crazy. I love it. I love it. He always comes up with a better sermon than me. I'm not, I'm not lying. The very verse we started with, that was not in my computer up in the notes. It was not. It wasn't on the screen until before I got out of bed. Before I got out of bed. Okay. This is the best thing. If, if the Lord talks to you, any, any part of this or anything, here's my counsel to you. Just say, okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> if he says repent, just say, okay, I'll repent. If he says get saved, okay, I guess I'll get saved. I thought I was saved, but maybe. I'll, whatever the Holy Spirit, not me, the Holy Spirit says to you, say, okay. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised, and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Okay, go back with me now. We'll pick up where we left off. Right in the middle, verse 37, verse 37. Listen to Jesus. You want to make sure you listen to Jesus. They were dogging Stephen because of Moses, and Stephen's been showing Moses. And then in verse 37, we saw this last week. Listen to Jesus. Um, Luke chapter 7 and verse 37. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Translated, that prophet is Jesus. That prophecy was made back in Deuteronomy 18, 15. We're supposed to listen to Jesus. Can I hear an Amen. Don't argue with him. When Jesus tells you something in the power of the Holy Spirit, listen to Jesus. That's what Moses told them to do. They didn't months earlier when Jesus stood right in front of them. They didn't when Jesus sent Peter and John. They didn't when all 12 apostles showed up. And they didn't. Now here's Jesus that just sent Stephen. Oh, excuse me, that's history. How about you and Jesus? How about you and the Holy Spirit? Guzik, I used this last week, but it's worth repeating. Guzik said, Moses promised that there would come after him another prophet and warned that Israel should take special care to listen to this coming prophet. But just like Israel rejected Moses, so they were rejecting Jesus, who is the prophet Moses spoke of. Each individual should consider for himself, for themselves, how they should accept Jesus and not reject him. They should receive him, Jesus, as your deliverer, the only one, the only one who can rescue you. So Stephen, preaching that, he says, you, you need to listen to Jesus. And here's how the fathers were resistant, the Old Testament fathers, resistant to the Holy Spirit. Verse 38, this is he, Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers. The one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. They rejected the law. They rejected the oral living oracles. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They turned back to Egypt. Saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what's become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol. Oh, now they're idol worshipers. This is just weeks after coming out of Egypt. And rejoiced in the works of their own hands. What's happening? Um, Stephen's just showing how the fathers were resistant to the Holy Spirit. They were. Make sure you're not. Be very, very careful before you take and start rejoicing in the work of your hands. Be really, really careful of idols. Be careful. That is actually what Israel did. Verse 42, then God turned. Here's God's response to their resistance, their sin. Then God turned and gave them up. Can I hear you say gave them up? Gave Some of you didn't say gave them up, but that's okay. <laughs> Just so you get the point, God gave up on them. That's in your Old Testament. 
The ones accusing Moses, they know that, but they don't understand that. God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heavens. Oh man, they're worshiping stars and the moon and the sun. As it's written in the book of the prophets, this comes from Amos chapter 5. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness? O house of Israel? Question mark. You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch. The star of your God, Rephim. Images which you made to worship. I will carry you away to Babylon. You want to know the Old Testament? They were resistant to the Holy Spirit. You understand with me the Old Testament didn't work, right? You understand with me it only works for the self-righteous who think they're right. You need a savior. You need Jesus. Hey, Israel, you need a savior. You need Jesus. I sent you my son and you crucified him. You rejected him. The Holy Spirit in you. God turned him over. You know, he says that same thing in the New Testament, right? You know that, right? Romans chapter one. Can I see Romans chapter one, verse 28? Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Do you understand God turned you over? No, no. Oh, remember the context though. Now, if that verse just showed up like that, we're all in deep trouble, but that verse shows up after Romans chapter one, verse 16. Can I see Romans 1, 16? I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ. It is the power of God to save for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for this Gentile, Greek, and Amarillo, Texas. Well, I thought you were pretty good. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner just like you. No, I was brought up in a church and I'm pretty good. No, you're not. You're self-righteous. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need to listen to Jesus. I'll follow Moses. I'm sorry. Most humble man on the earth, but he's not a God. Moses followed Jesus. That's who he was looking for. Are you, are you tracking with me? I, w I went in to preach there a little bit. Did you know what made me go in to preach? I didn't say my notes preach right there. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Who, who needs the gospel? Everybody. Well, how do we know everybody needs it? Read the rest of Romans chapter one. You're in that list. You're in the list. God turns us over to the gospel. Oh, by the way, I am in the list of Romans chapter one, and so are you. The list you don't want to be in is Romans chapter two. Romans chapter two are the self-righteous who don't think they need a savior. Oh, I'll take all the sinners in Romans chapter one and pray for all the ones that are self-righteous in Romans chapter two. I need Jesus. I need the Holy Spirit. I need to follow him. I need to be in the word. And I need to do that every day of my life. And as I do that, he teaches me, speaks to me about me. If you haven't figured out, I don't ever go looking for a sermon. Pretty much I spend all week just going like, Lord, what do you wanna teach me with this? What, what am I supposed to learn about Stephen? What am I supposed to learn about the Sanhedrin? What am I supposed to learn about not resisting the Holy Spirit? Lest I think I'm some kind of winner. When God, you know I'm a loser. Because this is all the Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit in you. And what, all I know that the Bible actually has already told us, they always kept resisting the Holy Spirit. Whoever you want to talk about, whatever story, they were resisting. The whole, I know we got some heroes in the Old Testament. I know we got men and women of faith in the Old Testament. Of course I know that. But we, we forget the big picture overall. They kept saying no to God and yes to Moloch. No to God and yes to Rephaim. 
And they, they somehow got to think, well, we got the law, we got the temple, we're Israel. And you miss Jesus. You're just like your fathers, you're always resisting the Holy Spirit. This whole thing about the temple, man, they were going on. The temple, I love the temple. I've been to where the temple stood. I've been there nine times. But I don't worship the temple. By the way, God didn't need the temple. I don't know if you knew that. God didn't need it. Verse 44, here's God's true temple. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. They're not even in Israel. But they had a tent as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land, of pro- into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the Lord God, for the God of Jacob, verse 47. But Solomon, his son, but Solomon built him a house, the first temple. However, can I hear you say however? however. You have a tabernacle, you have a temple. But then Stephen says, however, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Psalms 102, 25, has my hand not made all these things? You're all bragging about the temple in that second one, you know, that Herod the Great actually finished, took him 60 some years, became one of the wonders of the world. And Jesus said, every stone's coming down. Not one will be left upon another. What? God lives here. Well, you think he does. I mean, his presence is there, but that's not where God lives. He doesn't need a building. The universe is his throne. He uses the earth as a footstool. You think you can build him a house? Well, we have a church at Western and Plains. Just to remind you, you're in an old grocery store. It's my favorite room in the whole wide world. It absolutely is. But it's not a temple. God doesn't need it. They're going to rebuild a third one over there. They will. But God doesn't need it. What's amazing to me, what's amazing, the God of the universe, actually, can I see 1 Corinthians 6, 19? Your Bible says this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What? Who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You mean the God of the universe the Holy Spirit, and we also have references to the Father and the Son dwell in you, in you. In one way, I'm looking at a whole bunch of temples. Look at all these temples of God. Resist not the Holy Spirit when he talks to you. That's why your body is special. What you do with your body, you are the temple of God. It's not a stretch to go all the way and say, you know what? The holy of holies today is your heart for Jesus. The holy of holies. That's because whatever you put in, whatever you watch, whatever goes in your ears, whatever you contribute, we're the temple. You are of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing to me. One day he's going to call us all home. And then we'll get to see like the temple. Whoa. But then we go into the new kingdom, the new heaven, new earth, and there is no temple for the temple is God. Whoa, what are you saying? Don't get wrapped up about buildings. They're just buildings. And I love this one. God gave us this building. I love it. I love where it's at. But it's temporary. They're all mad at 
Stephen because of the temple and Moses and tradition. He finally gets to verse 51. We started there. He tells them the truth after coming through. He actually started with calling them his brethren and his fathers. And then he, as he works, he keeps saying, our fathers, our fathers, our fathers, proving the point that they resisted the Holy Spirit. And he finally says it. Here's his kicker. You stiff-necked. In other words, he's just telling them the truth. You stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate, and uncircumcised. You're uncircumcised in heart and ears. Oh, they were circumcised, all 70 of them, in the flesh. That was actually one of the bragging points. The problem was they weren't circumcised in their heart or their ears. Which if you do a study of that in the book of Deuteronomy, you'll see that's what God's talking about. What you do with your flesh, there's a whole, I'm not trying to take that away, but if, you, if you're gonna put all of your faith in that, whoa, 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 it's just gotta be your heart and your ears, your relationship to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You stiff-necked, stubborn, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your. Now, if you're walking through the whole sermon, he, he went from our to your in that verse. Our fathers, our fathers, our fathers. At that point, he's not including him in that anymore. You always resist, always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Make sure you're not in that verse. If you are, repent. Verse 52. Which of the prophets, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you have now become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. You're always resisting the Holy Spirit as your fathers. You're uncircumcised in heart. You're stubborn. You're stiff-necked. All of the prophets of the Old Testament, we killed them. And then the just one, they even talked about the Messiah. If they even talked about Jesus coming, the Christ, we killed them. And that's what you guys did. I'm not speaking to you, Stephen speaking to the Sanhedrin. Months before, you killed the just one. You murdered him. You rejected him. And not only that, You've never kept the law anyways. Hey, Stephen, you're going to make them mad. <laughs> hey, hey, Stephen, don't you know you're supposed to tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear? Hey, Stephen, Stephen, you're not stepping on the toes. You're cutting their feet off. <laughs> what are you doing? Telling them the truth. Amen. You know one thing about preaching through the Bible? You can't skip any verses. You realize I've had to preach sermons with verses I didn't want to preach. But I got to preach them. Why? They're in the Bible. They're right there in the context. Well, Lord, if I preach that, somebody's going to get mad and leave. Oh, we've had so many get, people get mad and leave. And I don't take any joy in that, but I just know if I tell you the truth, well, then only one of two things is going to happen. You might repent and agree with the word of God and get right with God, or you might just get up right now and walk out the back door. If you're wanting to walk out, this would not be a good time because people would say, I don't think they're using the bathroom. I think they're walking out. <laughs> Oh, I've, I've watched, I've watched, I've watched. 
Because the word of God all by itself goes right into where you're living, where you're sleeping, what you're shooting, what you're snorting, what you're drinking. It just does. If you think I sit around and think, how can I get them this week, Lord? <laughs> what I love is I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. I just have to say, here's where we are. We're going through the book of Acts. If it crosses over into your life, repent and say, okay. We just want a nice preacher. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I write nice on my hand every week. I do. I have to write it down. Because I don't want to be, I, I don't want to be overbalanced. I just want to be biblical. You can't call somebody stubborn. You stubborn little brother. <laughs> it doesn't work. You're stiff necked. God called him stiff necked 20 some times in the Old Testament. Well, why does he call them stiff-necked? Because they were stiff-necked. Why did he say uncircumcised? Because they were uncircumcised in heart. Why did he say you're always resistant? Because they always resisted the Holy Spirit. Don't. Uh, you won't win. Yeah, but this is who I am and stuff. Well, you come over into Christ, and guess what? He gets to be your total identity. Amen. Totally. He doesn't tell you at the beginning all he's going to do because you have to learn this through your whole life, and the Holy Spirit will give you. And it's, it's, the, most, it's the most beautiful way to live and the most beautiful way to die. Amen. Here I am, Lord. See, he gave everything for you. Guess what he wants back? Everything. Present your bodies as living sacrifice. So he can bless it and use it. It's really by his grace. It's actually by his grace that he would have Jesus stand in that spot. Extra by his grace that he had Peter and John stand in that same spot. And then the 12 apostles stand in the same spot. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And they all told him the same thing. A chance to repent. Stephen's preaching it more forthfully. He's the last one standing. And the Holy Spirit blessed him. I like what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon says this about his sermon. He takes the sharp knife of the word, rips up the sins of the people, laying open the inward parts of their hearts and the secrets of their soul. He could, have, he could not have delivered that searching address with greater fearlessness had he been assured that they would thank him for the operation. The fact that his death was certain had no other effect upon him than to make him yet more zealous. Oh, it's my last sermon, huh? Let me tell you the truth. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Be circumcised in heart and ear. You murdered Christ, you rejected Christ, come back to him. And that's why, oh, there's one more quote there, and this is Baxter. I like what Baxter says. I preach as though, I preach as though never to preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. That literally was Stephen's sermon. And in some former sense, mine too. It could be my last sermon. He didn't tell me that yet. <laughs> so here's their response, the Sanhedrin's response, the reaction. And when they heard these things, they fell to their knees and started crying out, be merciful to us, Lord. We have sinned. Lord, we beg of you, can we come to Jesus still? Does your Bible say that? I just lied to you. That's why I want you to see it in the Bible. Preachers lie to you all the time. Don't trust them. Trust the word of God, the word of God. Here's the reaction. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They're furious. They gnashed, they gnashed at him with their teeth. They gnashed at him with their teeth. So far, nobody's done that to me today. Please don't do that. You know, where you're grinding your 
molars and you're making that noise. And in the Greek, the, the tense of that is they, you know, as the sermon went on, the more the gnashing. Can you see it? Are, are you reminded when Jesus, how often he, he talked about the gnashing of the teeth? Guzik says it like this. Guzik says, the idea of gnashed at him with their teeth can't help but be reminded of the imagery of hell. Seven different times Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. These men were prominent, successful, appeared to be religious, yet they were rejecting God, associating themselves with hell, not heaven. The fullness of the Holy Spirit, verse 55, but he, Stephen, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. The sermon started with the glory of God. It ends with the glory of God. He gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus, Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. God! You saw what? Everybody else gnashing with their teeth. But one that he could see somehow in heaven. Not seated at the right hand of God. Not interceding for Stephen before the throne. Standing for Stephen. Standing for Stephen. Standing. What do you think he looked like? The Bible doesn't tell us. He maybe looked like a lamb that had been slain. That reference is used in Revelation. He might have looked like a lion. That reference is used. He might have looked. I know the disciples didn't recognize him in the resurrection. I know he has a glorified body. But what do you think he looked like? Do you think God, Jesus, was like... Mm. Persevere, Stephen, just persevere. <laughs> think that was it? I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think that was it. You see, when no one else would stand for Stephen, Jesus did. Yeah. I actually think that it was more like that kind of smile, that kind of reassurance, that kind of go, way to go, bud. Way to go. And Jesus could say, I know exactly how you feel been there, done that. I'm so proud of you. Do you understand the God that we follow, the Jesus we follow, the Holy Spirit that ministers to us? When he first comes along, he says, you have to believe. You have to believe him. You have to follow him. You have to believe, you have to believe in him. But did you know Jesus believes in you? Did you know that? When you can't believe in yourself, and yet over time with the Spirit of God and the Word of God, the, the Lord Jesus, he believes in you. He believed in Peter. He believed in John. He believed in Mary. He believed in them. And of course we believe in him. And of course we come with all of our weakness and all of our frailties. That is true. But he believes in you. And when it's at the end, he'll stand for you, Christy. He'll stand for you. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Oh, that really ticked them off. I mean, that's just like, that just, they, they lose it. Execution by stoning. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, cast him out of the city, stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They stoned Stephen. They stoned him as he was calling on God, saying, Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What a prayer to pray when you're dying. Receive my spirit. But then he goes on and he says, then he knelt down, cried out with a loud voice. He wanted everybody to hear. He knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. What? You prayed what? Your last breath said what? No, 
Don't charge them, Lord, with this sin. Now, I don't know about you guys. You come to my house and start throwing rocks at my house, I'm going to throw some rocks back. <laughs> Who are you trying to rock? Well, you got me outnumbered 70 to 1, but I bet I can hit one or two of you before I go down. Where's this coming? It's being full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit. We know Jesus prayed the same, the same prayer. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But that's Jesus. That's not me. That's not Stephen. Stephen, Stephen, how, how, where did you get that? From the Holy Spirit. If I said it this way, who's rocking your world? On Facebook, who's rocking your world at school? Who's rocking your world? Oh, I just saw one lady hit her husband. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. She got him right in the chin. But just it's way to go. <laughs> Who's rocking your world? Here's the key. Here's the secret, being full of the Holy Spirit. Look at what Corson says. Look at what Corson says. When I truly see Jesus, I have no other choice but to be amazed at his grace and to be at peace with others to be at peace with others. It's only when I lower my sight and begin to look at people horizontally that I want to say, who do you think you are to say that about me? It's only when I take my eyes off Jesus that I become defensive, antagonistic, uptight, combative, abrasive, callous, and critical. Next time you get in a fight, look to Jesus. Beautiful way the Holy Spirit ends his story. Oh, one more thought, though. Um, when he prayed that prayer, not to charge them with this sin. Did you know God the Father heard that prayer? Do you know who benefited from that prayer? The kid watching the clothes. He's probably 22, 24 years old. And then one day, he's on a horse trip in Damascus outside of Israel, and Jesus shows up. The Apostle Paul was saved because of his prayer. Augustine said that. Can I see the quote? If Stephen had not prayed, the church would not have had Paul. Last point, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I love the way the New Testament talks about believers that when we die, it doesn't really say we die, it says we fall asleep. That's not saying their souls sleep, it's just saying like, okay, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And Stephen died. Here's a couple pointers. I was thinking about this last night. Okay, the best way to live and the best way to die using Stephen. Best way to live, the best way to die. Number one, follow Jesus. Can I hear an amen? amen? If the Holy Spirit's talking to you saying you don't really follow Jesus, then this is the day you need to follow Jesus. Right. You just need to say yes. And I'd include with that follow Jesus and the word. I wrote these down really quick last night. I just sent them. This is part of what I sent my, my staff this morning. Like, okay, summarize it. Well, follow Jesus. Best way to live and die, be full of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know what the Holy Spirit's telling you about that, but when's the last time you actually prayed to be full of the Holy Spirit? When is the last time you asked Jesus for another drink? We've looked at that and looked at that. We talk about that all the time. But you still have to, to, to be drunk, you have to drink. Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. When's the last time you asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Resist not the Holy Spirit. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Serve the local church. You say, why are you throwing that one in? That's where Stephen, there's a need, there's a need. And he had a gift and he was recognized and he jumped in and, and he helped. Best way to live, best way to die. Grow in your gifting. Whoa, 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 whoa. Over time, you know, he went from taking care of widows to where signs and wonders are happening. He's the first guy to do that after the apostles. There's always growth for you. Grow in your gifting. Point people to Jesus. Even if they say no. Point people to Jesus. Speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth. Stay focused on Jesus. 
pray for the ones throwing the rocks. Amen. Amen. The Lord loves you. As a pastor, I love you. As your brother, I love you. Keep a teachable heart. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Follow Jesus. And hang on. It will not be boring. I am more excited about the future than just telling old stories from the past. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the patience of these people, Lord. More importantly, thank you for your Holy Spirit and your Son and how they bring the word to life. Thank you that it's like a mirror. We see ourselves. I know all of us, Lord, have seen different parts of ourselves even as we've walked through your word this morning. Help us to quickly agree with the Holy Spirit and not the excuses we always want to use. Remind us that your grace eventually can run out. And that by your grace, we all have an opportunity again just to come before Jesus, before you, with the Holy Spirit. Here we are, Lord. Your will be done. I give you grace, church. I thank you for this day. And however longer, Lord, you want this church, however longer you want me to be a part of it, I thank you for the privilege. All the staff, all the radio, all the outreaches, Lord, humbled that you would use us. But Lord, not surprised that you want to bless your word. Help it always to be about your word. And I just think, Lord, all those things, we had to have a teachable heart to learn them. We haven't arrived. You're still teaching us. Help us to discern his voice when he whispers. And thank you, Holy Spirit, you know when to shout. Thank you for the word. How you meet with us, Lord, in the quiet. Thank you for how you stand with us, Lord. God, you stand. Empower my friends, I pray. Give them courage and the will and the strength to love. Pray for all the rocks that people throw. That, Lord, we would look like Jesus, like Stephen. And Peter and John, that we would be quick, quick when the Holy Spirit nudges us turn off whatever influence to stop whatever drug. to be a called out people separate for Jesus. I'm thankful, Lord, for my friends and this family. I'm very, very thankful. Could be you're here today and it's your first time or maybe you've been here 20 years. But the Holy Spirit has talked to you over and over and over. And you've resisted. You've said no to Jesus. Somehow in your own self-righteousness, somehow in your own religion, somehow in your own Bible keeping, you think you're better and you don't need Jesus. Or it could be you're so sinful that you think Jesus would never have me. The amazing part about the scripture, he wants both, the self-righteous and the sinner. 
to where we just say yes to you. We're going to follow you, Lord. We're going to listen to you. And that might be you this morning. I just, before we close this down, and this is, I promise this is the end. If you're here this morning and you know the Holy Spirit wants you just to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'll just pray for you from up here. But there's something about when we confess him before men, the Father will confess you, or Jesus will confess you before the Father. So thank you, brother, back there. Is there anybody else? Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Anybody else? want to make sure I get this right before I pray. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. You know, it takes a lot to stand up like this. Thank you, brother. But there's something about knowing Jesus stood up for us. Father, I just pray for my friends. I know you're mindful of their hearts. I know it's a work only the Holy Spirit can do, but we just say yes to him. We say yes to Jesus. And believing in him and what he did in his death, burial, resurrection, in, in one sense, that's just the beginning. We believe that, we believe that. And then all of a sudden our heart and our ears are circumcised. All of a sudden you take residence. We, <laughs> we in our flesh, somehow you're the temple now with God and things start to change from the inside out. So I just, I just rejoice for all these that stand, Lord, that you would bless them, that we would rejoice because of them. But most of all, we rejoice because of Jesus. And we have the profound privilege, young and old, brand new believers, to follow after him. It is absolutely the best way to live and die. For the glory of Christ and all God's people would say, you guys want to thank and welcome these guys that would stand in front of you? Amen. 40, here we go. 40, here we go. Let's close down the service.